about sham joint ventures. Uh, it's an issue that I've been paying attention to for a couple of years now. And uh, I think it's become, in my view, more and more of a problem in, <coughs> in the title market, particularly in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area for some reason. Um, so uh, <coughs> I want to talk about that and talk about the risks that, um, that uh, new uh, attention by regulators pose to real estate agents uh, who, of course, have to participate in these joint ventures for them to work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it from the title company perspective, but also from the real estate agent's perspective. And I'll begin by, by just defining what a sham joint venture is. And I use that term sham because um, I don't, federal law does not outlaw joint ventures, right? We, we know that under RESPA, there are, uh, there's this concept of affiliated business arrangements that, that anticipates that different settlement service providers will work with each other. And, um, and, and there's a way to do that lawfully. Um, so when I talk about sham joint ventures, I'm talking about arrangements that don't <clears throat> meet the test for, affiliate, for an affiliated business arrangement under RESPA. And I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about what that test is and how I think most of the joint ventures that exist in this area between real estate agents and title companies do not meet that test. But um, I, don't, I don't come here today to, to speak against all joint ventures, okay? Um, I'm, I'm talking about sham joint ventures. And a sham joint venture is one in, in the title context where a title company will recruit real estate agents to join uh, in a new joint venture, a, new a brand new title company <coughs> that is um, majority owned usually by the existing title company and then uh, shares are given also or sold uh, to what, what they call investors, but they're really real estate agents who are becoming joint venturous with the existing title company. Um, the, the reason that, that I think the, that I call these companies shams is because they're not capitalized like a normal title company. In fact, there, there was this recent in enforcement action that I'll talk about in a minute involving Allied uh, title uh, had joint ventures that were capitalized at $40,000 each. Okay, no functioning title company can be capitalized at $40,000 each, right? I mean, that's just, that's a joke. And yet that was the valuation that was used to allow real estate agents to buy five, 10, 15% shares in these companies. Um, and that is, uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an artifice, right? That's a way to bring real estate agents into a business so that they could share in the profits, um, that, that new title company's profits that, that result from referrals that the real estate agents make to the new joint venture that they partly own. Okay, <clears throat> it's just uh, kickbacks are illegal, so we'll create this business that will act that will kickbacks. That's what that is. And um, I usually, when, I, when I've done this talk before, I usually then start with RESPA, but I feel compelled today to talk about how state laws address this problem because uh, just last week, the District of Columbia Attorney General brought four enforcement actions against uh, title companies that had set up these joint ventures. And uh, the, <coughs> one of the, um, I, I'll just, I feel I should probably start by just telling you what the DC law provides, okay? One thing you should know is that these state laws can be more restrictive than RESPA. So companies can comply with RESPA and still violate different state laws, and DC is one of those laws. So in the District of Columbia, there's a law that says a title insurer or other person shall not give or receive, directly or indirectly, any consideration for the referral of title insurance business or escrow or other service provided by a title insurer. Okay, so it applies to title companies, it applies to any other person, it applies to people who give, and it applies to people who receive. So those are the title companies, those are real estate agents. So if you're a real estate agent in the District of Columbia and you participate in a joint venture, that shares its profits, you are receiving compensation in exchange for the referrals that you make to that company, and you're violating the DC code. And then, and as I said last week, the Attorney General brought four cases uh, against uh, Allied, KVS, and then two companies that were set up for the purpose of, of, of paying these kickbacks, Modern and Union. Um, uh, and the, the Attorney General charged violations of that DC code provision that I just read, but it also charged this conduct as an unfair practice under the DC code. There's a DC consumer protection law. It's very similar to 
the federal uh, consumer protection laws that, pro that prohibit unfair practices, unfair trade practices. Almost every state has a law like that. Virginia and Maryland have, have laws that also prohibit unfair practices. Um, and, the, and the DC Attorney General charged um, these four title companies and their affiliates, the, the shell companies that they set up, and the people who participated in the joint ventures, um, it charged them with violating the DC code in, that two, in those two respects, the law that I read, and then also the ban on unfair trade practices. Uh, now the, the, I think the Attorney General could have charged uh, RESPA violations. Um, the, the states have authority to charge RESPA violations, and it's not just the CFPB, um, the states can do it as well. And um, I'm going to talk in a minute about um, you know, why I think RESPA would, have, would prohibit the, the JVs that were at issue in that DC case. But again, I just want to make clear that um, you, can, you can comply with RESPA and still violate the laws. And that's what DC did, right? It decided not to get into the RESPA business, didn't want to pick a fight, didn't want to get bogged down in arguing about whether RESPA was violated because they had a very clear state law that prohibited this conduct. And that's what they did. I think it was a smart, you know, from a former law enforcement um, uh, attorney's perspective, I think that was a smart way to, to do it. They, they, were, they were able to bring these cases quickly and they resolved them and they obtained over $3.2 million in fines from these companies. Ally is going to pay a $1.9 million fine. And they're all, all those companies are going to stop their JVs in the district. So I thought that was a good result. Um, to talk about RESPA, you know, as, as, you, as you know, RESPA prohibits kickbacks, right? You cannot give or accept a thing of value for business referrals. There's this exception that I mentioned for affiliated business arrangements. Um, <clears throat> to, to qualify as an affiliated business arrangement under RESPA and be exempt from the, kick, from the kickback ban, they have to meet three requirements. You have to disclose the relationship. You can't require the use of any particular title company. <clears throat> um, and, the, and then the third, the only thing of value that the, the participants in the, in the arrangement can get um, is a, their share of the profits that the company generates, okay? So a um, couple of agents and uh, title company get together, they form a joint venture, you know, value it at a million dollars. Uh, each of the f four agents pay, um, pay uh, $100,000 each, and each of them then owns 10% of this company. The company operates, the agents refer their, their uh, customers to this JV to do title work, the profits are distributed, uh, to the agents at 10% each, okay? That's a lawful affiliated business arrangement. Does not violate RESPA. Um, does violate the DC code. May violate Maryland law, Virginia law, and other states' laws. But it may be, it's likely legal under RESPA. These JVs, the ones that were at issue in the DC case, I don't think qualify as affiliated business arrangements under RESPA because they, um, the, the, they don't meet that third requirement. That the only thing of value the agents can get is their share of the profits. But what happens with these JVs, the, like, like the ones that Allied set up that were capitalized at $40,000 each, is the agents were getting a different thing of value beyond the one that they were allowed to get under the law. And that was th a discounted investment opportunity. The opportunity to buy in to a fully functioning title company valued at $40,000. Okay, I mean, that's just, that's just a joke. Like, uh, hey, I, I, would, I, I would love to invest in an, an, an opportunity. They don't offer that opportunity to me because I don't have business to refer, right? So, um, you know, I think those are not lawful um, affiliated business arrangements. And I think that then the way they operate, when they distribute profits at the end of the year, that's just a, that's just a kickback. That's a, that's a Section 8 RESPA violation. And I think the D.C. Attorney General, any, any Attorney General, the CFPB, could charge that conduct as violating RESPA. Uh, question was, were the agents fined as well? Uh, no, the fines were imposed against the title companies, but the DC Attorney General in its press material said that it's, um, I think they used the word, <laughs> uh, keeping, keeping an eye on the agents. Um, I'm not sure that they're done. I'm not sure that the DC Attorney General is done. Um, it doesn't end, you know, it doesn't end the case. And, and, and by the way, the, you know, the D.C. Attorney General resolved its case, and it had a release in, in, the, in each of the uh, orders, the um, assurances of uh, cessation of violations. Um, it had a release. But that release doesn't, that release applies to the D.C. Attorney General. 
the CFPB could look at this and say, well, this conduct violates RESPA, and this conduct violates the Consumer Financial Protection Act, which I'll talk about in a minute, and it could sue the real estate agents. And, and I would not rule out that that, that, that might happen. So um, if, any, if you're a real estate agent and you take comfort from the fact that the D.C. Attorney General didn't specifically call out and fine real estate agents, you're, you're playing with fire because I think um, you know, that's very tempting for, for a regulator to go after a real estate agent on the facts that were, that were revealed by the D.C. Attorney General. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm ha I, I do welcome questions. Um, I don't mean to be just standing here talking to you for, <coughs> for 45 minutes. So um, if you have questions as we go, uh, happy to answer them. Um, I, will, I, I think that what the D.C. Attorney General did was legally correct. Um, I, I'm not here to make policy or judge on, on policy decisions that the D.C. Attorney General makes, but I will tell you that it was legally correct. And uh, y you'll see out there in the press, in our trade industry, our trade press, there are people who are criticizing. In fact, some of the people who represented companies that settled the cases are now are criticizing the cases. Um, and, uh, you know, and, I, and I, I will debate them all day long because I, I just think they're wrong um, and, uh, and I'm happy to discuss it with anybody. So um, any, other, any other questions before I, I move on to what I think is um, probably the, the most new part of this? which is uh, I think that the, the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010, the CFPA, which is part of Dodd-Frank Act, I think that poses a risk to these title companies and in particular to, to real estate agents. So um, normally real estate agents are, are not subject to the Consumer Financial Protection Act because they're not, you're not covered persons. You're not offering a consumer financial product or service. Um, and there's actually a provision of the CFPA that exempts real estate agents and brokers from coverage under this act to the extent that they're not offering a consumer financial product or service. Um, the law says that, uh, that the, the, um, the Bureau may not exercise any rulemaking, supervisory, enforcement, or other authority with respect to a real estate agent, okay? But when real estate agents mater materially participate in these joint ventures, they're exposing themselves in a way that the law otherwise protects them. Okay, because now they are, by materially participating in a joint venture, they are becoming what, what this statute calls a related person. Um, the re and, and a related person under the CFPA is deemed a covered person. And so now you're pulled back in and the CFPB and the state attorneys general who all have authority to enforce the CFPA can now go after real estate agents if they violate the CFPA. Um, how might they violate the CFPA? Well, I think that the, the prohibition on abusive conduct could, ap could be applied to the fact pattern that I, that I mentioned with, uh, with these title companies and real estate agents. Um, the CFPA defines abusiveness to include taking unreasonable advantage of the reasonable reliance by the consumer on a covered person to act in the interests of the consumer. Okay, so there's a lot of parts to that. The consumer's reliance on the covered person has to be reasonable, has to be a covered person, right? It can't be a real estate agent who's not participating in a joint venture. But if you're a real estate agent, you're participating in a joint venture, now you're deemed a covered person, and you've formed a relationship with a home buyer, say, over the course of several weeks as you show them potential homes and you give advice on certain things. Um, it, it's quite likely reasonable for the consumer to start to rely on you to act in the consumer's interest, right? And then when it comes time, they make an offer and they have to now decide a title company to use or a settlement service provider, or settlement company to use, and you say, hey, I got one for you. You know, this other company um, that, I, that, I'm, that I work with is a great title company. Go, go ahead, you know, go with them. If that's a company that the real estate agent partly owns, they're acting in their interest, not the consumer's interest, right? The consumer's interest is, here's a company that I, that I work with. Here are three other companies. You should call them. You should, you should shop, price and service. Talk to your friends. Make, it, make an informed decision. That's what's in the consumer's interest. But if you steer that consumer to your company, your JV, you're acting in your interest, not the consumer's interest. And I think that's a violation of the 
CFPA's prohibition on abusive conduct. Yeah, who, who has the interest in the title so company? The, the buyer's the agent or the seller, the listing agent? agent. Yeah. The seller's agent has the interest, but it's a competitive listing, and, and yeah. you have, you're one of eight offers on the table. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think in that case, the listing agent is violating the, the CFPA. I mean, the... the Oh no! I think that so the listing agent is part of the, is in a is in a JV, right? Yeah. So yeah, that that JV that they're violating the law as well, but the, but in but specifically in that in that scenario, the listing agent I think is also is committing an abusive act. Okay, the the listing agent is steering the a consumer to uh, a title company that it that it owns, and and the buyer's agent in that situation also. I mean, like. You're saying, well, we, we need we have to put the um, the the their title company in our offer to be competitive. Is that is that I the mean, idea? Yeah. You don't yeah. Have to, but yeah, but if you want to be competitive, yeah. Where you're trying to do everything, yeah. You're, you know, them. Yeah. So uh, I mean, first of all, I think that's a RESPA violation. I mean, the disclosure there's no disclosure there at the time of the referral, right? It's just like usually there is. It's okay. Buried in the disclosure yeah. Yeah. Buried in the disclosure, but not. But is it at the time of referral, it's or is it after? I Yeah. Yeah. I. I. I would. Uh, I would bring that RESPA case all day long if I could. No, I think that's. A, I think that's a problem. Yeah. Sure. So I. I don't. I. I don't know about. Um, I mean, Bill, who are they providing the incentives to? The buyers. Yeah. I. I don't know. I don't know about that situation. I haven't thought about that enough. Um. I do want to say one other thing about how, how this kind of could be abusive. It's not just the steering, but, um, but I think there's a problem with the lack of neutrality, right? If, you're, if, if, the, um, if the covered person is, has to act in the consumer's interest, okay, if you're an agent and now you've got this consumer who's relying on you and you partly own a, a title company um, and then you go to closing and the title company that is doing the closing is partly owned by the agent for one of the parties to the closing. Okay, that, that seems to me to be a pretty significant conflict of interest, right? And then, and then that title company and that, that the agent partly owns is not acting in, you know, it can't act in, in it, it's not supposed to act in either party's interest, right? It's supposed to be a neutral. Um, and, and yet, if it's partly owned by, literally by the agent for one of the parties, I think that's a problem. I don't think it matters. I think uh, whether it's a broker or a real estate agent, it do, it, uh, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the DC um, cases, they brought four cases last week. I don't know whether they're done. I, d I doubt it. Um, you know, I think typically what a law enforcement agency will do is they'll bring cases and they hope to make a mark on the, on the market, right? They hope that it will influence people's behavior because that, that's a wise use of resources to, to, just, to, to see whether you've corrected a problem by bringing some high-profile cases. But I don't think if the, if the conduct continues, I don't think the AG is just going to be like, well, you know, we did that in 2024, so we're done. You know, I, I think there'd be more cases on the way. And I think it'll happen in other jurisdictions as well. I mean, I think there's going to be more pressure now there are other states that have laws like D.C. that flat out ban, I mean, the D.C. law bans affiliated business arrangements. And there are other states that have laws like that, Arizona, New York, Ohio. Um, and so there are those states that I think are going to feel pressure to bring cases like this now that D.C. has done it. And then I think because D.C. charged it as an as unfair trade practice, uh, I think that puts pressure on Maryland and Virginia as well. I mean, they have those laws too. I think it puts pressure on the CFPB. And I think the CFPB, uh, before the year is done, will bring a case like this. It may not involve a title company, but I think it'll involve real estate agents. Maybe.
mortgage company. I mean, the, the, the problem is the same whether it's a title company or a mortgage company that forms JVs with real estate agents, right? If, if, a, if a real estate agent is steering their, the home buyer to a particular mortgage company that the, that the real estate agent partly owns, it presents all the same problems under RESPA and the CFPA. Uh, I'm not sure that there is going to be broker liability for agents' conduct under the CFPA. It's a, I mean, the CFPA and RESPA, you know, those are specific to the to an actor's conduct, and I don't, I'm not sure that there are easy mechanisms to hold other people responsible for the acts of their agents. Um, so I, I don't, you know, again, I probably could think about that more and, and give you a better answer, but um, off the top of my head, I don't think that brokers are going to be held liable for their agents' conduct. Um, I think title companies could be held liable under the CFPA for, their, uh, for the, the agents' conduct when the agents are part of a joint venture with the title company. Because in those cases, I think the title companies, even though the agents are the ones committing the abusive acts and practice, title, company, title companies are providing substantial assistance to that, and that's also illegal under the CFPA. So there are ways that, that title companies can get into trouble for, under the CFPA for the agent's conduct. They all can get on, into trouble under RESPA for this conduct because they're, they're each individually violated. There were more, I think there were more questions. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think sometimes bro some brokerages do this, but um, the problem, <coughs> I think the, the, the problem that was addressed last week involved actual just real estate agents, uh, groups of real estate agents sometimes, but, but agents acting independent of their brokers. I'll say that under the, under the CFPA, the, the penalty for this is pretty harsh. Um, Ordinary violations are punished by $7,000 per violation. Reckless violations, I think it's 34000 per violation. And knowing violations are $1.4 million per violation. And um, I'm doing my best to make this problem known so that people who violate this are at least acting recklessly. You're all on notice now. Yeah. Attendance will be taken. Um, anyone else? What else we got? Yep. No, no. It's not. A, it's, it's also not a problem if you don't own those companies. <laughs> I mean, so the, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think the way, the way, if you're a real estate agent, and you've had good experiences and bad experiences with title companies, it's perfectly appropriate for you to tell your your customer, here are th here are two or three companies that I've had good experiences with. You should call them. Give them six. Give them whatever. Call them. Say, call these companies, find out what it's going to cost, and, and, uh, and, and talk to your friends and find out if, you know, what their reputation is for service because you don't want to have a problem at the closing table. And by, I mean, we're, we're very sophisticated. This is a very sophisticated room, right? I mean, I'm, I, I was a lawyer at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, so I, ha I bought houses. And that, that's how I do it. I mean, when I refinanced, I, 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 would, I Googled title companies in Montgomery County, and I found three. And I asked them for quotes, and I got very different quotes on price, and um, you know, and I always went with uh, federal title. Yeah. No, I'm kidding, I, was I never went with federal title, but uh, but I always went with the I always went with the lowest price. I mean, that was all, that's all I cared about. But yeah.
so so what the documentation yeah Yeah, okay, let me, I, I, I want to talk about um, the documents, but, what, but when I was talking about the three requirements for RESPA, those are three requirements to be a lawful affiliated business arrangement, which takes you out of the prohibition on kickbacks. So if you wanted to comply with RESPA, you'd have to do those three things. You'd have to disclose the relationship that, that the agent has with the, title, with the JV title company. You cannot require the use of any title company, and that's where I think a listing agent gets into trouble by, by putting the, you know, on MLS the, the name of the title company. Um, and then, then there's that, then the third issue is the one about the only thing of value that any of these participants can get is their share of the profits. Okay, so those are the three things you have to do to be a lawful affiliated business arrangement. A lot of um, what I've been hearing, especially in the last few days, from agents and title companies and attorneys for title companies is, well, look, we, we've disclosed this, okay? So there can't, there's nothing wrong here. Like we did the disclosure. Um, and the disclosure is a requirement to be, a, to be an affiliated business arrangement. The disclosure has no relevance to whether you violate DC code, okay? The DC code doesn't care if it's a lawful affiliated business arrangement. As a matter of fact, it outlaws lawful affiliated business arrangements. So it just doesn't matter. And, then, and the other thing I'll, I'll caution is I have seen some of these disclosures, okay? And I know uh, you too. I'm sorry, they're impenetrable. I mean, they're, I, I have two degrees. I'm not maybe the, you know, the, the sharpest guy in the room, but I'm pretty sophisticated, relatively speaking, and I find them extremely confusing. Um, I don't think the CFPB is going to be at all dissuaded by the fact that someone purportedly gave a disclosure of this affiliated business arrangement. Um, the CFPB has brought, infor I brought enforcement actions against companies where there had been disclosures you know, that's tr attempted to cure the unlawful conduct. And the Bureau doesn't care, and I don't think the law cares either. Um, you know, so, so the disclosure is important. I mean, I'm not telling you not to do it. If, you, if you're operating lawfully, you've got a lawful affiliated business arrangement, you ought to, you get, you've got to do the disclosure. Otherwise, you're going to get in trouble. But I, I would not take comfort. I, do, I, I would not operate in a state um, that prohibits uh, uh, joint ventures and think to myself, well, I'm good because I'm disclosing it. And I think, that's, I think you're going to get sued. Is there anyone in the room who still thinks this is a good idea? <laughs> yeah. To your knowledge, are there still these JVs operating in DC? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The ones that are agent-owned? Yeah. Not the, the ones that were sued last week are all shutting down and paying, <laughs> and paying millions of dollars in fines. But, oh, yeah, but no, no, the problem is still out there. Yeah. I don't think DC's done. I don't think DC's done. I don't think the CFPB is done. And, and, and uh, you know, in your subject... If, if those companies that are doing it, you know, they, they piss off the wrong customer and there's a, a call, a, you know, a call to the, to the government and, you know, they're in trouble. So I, I think they're very vulnerable um, and I just think they should, they should sort of revisit how they get, how they do business. They should market for business on cost and service like everyone else in the world. They shouldn't pay bribes to get referrals. Any others?